Hi everybody, I hope that you're doing well this week. This is Pastor Chris Grant from St. Peter Lutheran Church in Warwick, New York, and I'm excited to share another message with you this week. Uh, we are open for service, so if you'd like to join us live for, uh, for a worship service, we are at 11 a.m. at uh, 70 Little York Road in Warwick, New York, and I'd love to get a chance to meet you in person. So we just kicked off a new sermon series last week, which was Transfiguration Sunday, which is going to take us through the season of Lent. And the series is titled, Can I Get a Witness? And the series verse is Acts 1.8, which is, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Samaria and in all Judea and to the ends of the earth. And each week we're looking at the gospel reading to see what it tells us. What does that gospel reading for that week tell us about what it means to be God's witness across all different areas? So in the first message, we looked at the significance of what we are witnesses to, the glory of God revealed to Peter, James, and John at the Transfiguration, a God who is in complete control, whose brightness is able to cover the stains of our sin. And when we stand in front of the judgment seat, we are witnesses of the God who is able to cover over all those stains with his bright whiteness. Even if we personally only witness him in a concealed form, it is that God of glory that we are witnesses to. This week, we are looking at Matthew, or sorry, Mark 1, 9 to 15, focusing just on the verses 14 and 15, Mark 1, 14 and 15, which read, Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Relieve the good news. Now in these two verses, there's a bit of a changing of the guard happening. The public ministry of John the Baptist has come to an end as he's been arrested, and Jesus is now beginning his public ministry. So to set this up, I want to talk about something. I want to talk about the power of words. The power of words. There are many kinds of words that we can give to somebody in terms of a, a sentence that we can say. There are words of advice, you know, telling somebody what they should or shouldn't do. There's words of correction, you know, looking back and saying, maybe you shouldn't have done that. There's words of information, you know, here's something that has happened or something that will happen and, and we can learn from those informative words. There's words of warning to say, don't do this, or if you do, bad things will happen. Words can guide, they can insult, they can describe, all kinds of things. But there's actually an even more powerful kind of word than these that I've talked about. Some words are actually able to create reality creative words that actually change circumstances. You might say, how do words change circumstances? How do words actually change reality? Well, a silly example would be um, at a previous church I served, I was uh, part of the leadership of a youth group and we used to have dodgeball games and I would stand on the side and all the kids would be on, you know, half the kids would be on one side and half the kids would be on the other side and they'd be all wait for that one word. And that word was go. As soon as I said go, there was a dodgeball game. Up until that point, there was no dodgeball game. If somebody else said the word go, maybe a few kids would run out and then they'd have to go back because the word go was not spoken by the person who was in control. So as soon as I said go, that word actually created reality. It created a game. Another example would be a judge. A judge gets handed a piece of paper, but that judge actually, his words actually create the, the reality of a conviction. When that judge says guilty, it's not just information. It's not an FYI guilty. It actually creates the reality of a conviction and everything that comes with it. Another one would be at a wedding. You know, what, is, what are the words that everybody is waiting to hear at a wedding? It's not the vows. It's not the beautiful music. No, it's the words. What are they waiting? They're waiting to hear. I now pronounce you husband and wife. And a marriage is actually created by those words. The, before that happens, the bride and the groom are looking at each other like waiting to be married. And as soon as those words are spoken, I now pronounce you husband and wife, the marriage is actually created. See, in each case, go, you know, with a dodgeball game or guilty or I now pronounce you husband and wife, those words actually create reality. Some words actually do this. And there are a few common characteristics of the people speaking these creative words. In each case, the person has the authority, the power, and the ability to speak a new reality into existence. Now, this is how God has worked throughout history, using words to create new realities. Uh, of course, if you know the, the beginning of the Bible, Genesis 1, God spoke into the chaos and, uh, and wilderness saying, 
let there be light, and there was light. His words actually had the power to create physical reality. There was a pattern. There was a re reality, a previous reality, words spoken, and then a new reality. There was nothing, let there be light, and then creation began. He had the authority and power to create the universe. That's a lot of authority and a whole lot of power. Another example, in Mark 2, verses 5 to 7, Jesus says to a paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven. And then it says, now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why did this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Again, you have this reality of a man in sin, and then a word spoken, your sins are forgiven, and then a new reality created, a forgiven man. So now coming back to our text for today, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. That's what he says. Repent and believe the good news. He spoke, speaks that to the people. Now, what kind of word was that when he spoke proclaiming, repent and believe the good news? Was that a word of guidance? Was that a word of information? A word that is describing reality? Was Jesus saying, it is my suggestion to you that you repent and believe the good news or my advice to you or, or in case you are curious, one of your options is to repent and believe the good news. Now, I don't think that's the type of word Jesus was speaking. When Jesus said repent and believe the good news, it was not just an FYI or a suggestion. It wasn't a pretty please request. It was a creative word, a word that created faith in people who heard it. It was a word of power. The power and glory of God that was revealed in the transfiguration is at work in his words, repent and believe the good news. And see, that powerful word is a word he's entrusted to the church. That's an awesome responsibility to be entrusted, not just with an informational word, not just a word that describes something, not a word of advice, but a word that creates reality, that creates faith in lost people, a word that strengthens faith to Christians. That's a big responsibility that God has given the church to be entrusted with the power of that creative word. See, when I was called to be pastor to St. Peter, I was entrusted with this creative word on behalf of the faith community that we have uh, during our services. And that's a big responsibility. It's someone, obviously one I take seriously, to proclaim God's word faithfully, to preach his message accurately and to live in accordance with that word. It's a very important word that God has given to the church. But that same word that God has given to me on behalf of that one faith community during the service has been given to all of his people, to you, to make things happen in the world. See, I have a small group that I'm responsible for, but as Christians, we're responsible and you're responsible for the whole world. Repent and believe the good news. It's a word that's been given to you to create new realities. You are called to bring that word to the world. Repent and believe the good news. It's not just a please believe or it's my strong suggestion. God works powerfully through his word to create new realities in the life of people. And he does that through you, his witnesses. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. That's what Hebrews says about the power of God's word. As a witness, the power of God is working through the words in your mouth, calling people to repentance and faith. So let's take a quick, closer look at the word itself that was preached in Mark 1 here in our text for today. God's word that came, that started with John the Baptist and then through Jesus, repent and believe the good news. See, they weren't just preaching to the wind. They were preaching to a specific people at that time. See, earlier in Mark 1, it says of John that, all the Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. So this was not a message that John and Jesus were speaking to just a particular group of people in Judea, not just for the criminals and the lowlifes or the beggars. It was for everyone. Everyone went out to hear him and th those words were spoken to everyone. So in addition to the commoners and the farmers and the shepherds and the craftsmen, there were a number of specific Jewish religious groups that were part of the big tent of Judaism. Just to name a few, the Pharisees, who saw adherence to the law as a way of keeping themselves from the influence of worldliness. Or the Zealots, who hated, their, hated that their land was occupied and influenced by Rome and used violence to try to gain political freedom. 
or the Essenes who withdrew from society into separate communities, kind of like monks. These groups and all the other ones came to hear John and Jesus preach the message, repent and believe the good news. All of these people came to hear a message that was intended for them, not just the criminals and the lowlifes. Many of you have heard this before, but to repent means to change your mind. In first century Judea, the fact that the word repent was for every, that was for everyone is interesting. It was not just for the worst of sinners or the foreigners. It was a word for God's people. Even the most religious, the Pharisees, the Essenes, repent, turn away from your sin of mind, sin of deed. Turn towards God. And there's a message in there for us in the church. See, for some people in the church, they see repentance as a moment. It was the time when they turned away from their sin and, and their old life and received Christ. And from that point on, they're no longer sinners. Their repentance is done. They have already made the turn. See, this is dangerous thinking. The problem with the Pharisees was not that they were sinners. Everyone is a sinner. It was that they refused the words of Jesus to repent. In one way, they had the least to repent from. They were the most obedient to God's commands. And yet they rejected God's word of repentance. They must have thought, who cares about repentance? And that is why Jesus came down so hard on the Pharisees. They had hardened themselves to their own need for repentance. They wanted to stand on their own goodness, which is not a good place to be standing in front of a mighty God. That's a danger for us as well. See, if I am in the church and I think I repented when I became a Christian and I'm no longer a sinner, why do I need to repent? If I am no longer a sinner, why do I need the body and blood of Christ for the forgiveness of sins? When God says to confess your sins to one another, why should I? Sin is irrelevant now, which means repentance is not necessary. That's a dangerous place to be. Humbling ourselves before God is to admit that we are sinners who are constantly called to a life of repentance. Paul is a great example of this. In 1 Timothy 1, 15 and 16, the great Saint Paul is writing that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And he says, of whom I am the worst. But, and, then, and then he says, but for the very reason I was shown mercy that in me the worst of sinners, the worst of sinners, not the artist formerly known as the worst of sinners, the worst of sinners, Paul says, that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Even the great St. Paul said he was a sinner after he had received forgiveness. And so Jesus' Jesus's call to repentance is a call for us, too, to live a life of repentance, receiving God's grace and his forgiveness as he continues to transform us into his image. See, that's the good news part. Believe the good news. The word here for good news is the same word for gospel. And the gospel message is that your ongoing refusal to accept God's will in your everyday life is not a death sentence. When you don't repent, when you have those moments of unrepentance, that doesn't mean you fail. The good news is it's not a death sentence when you're short with your spouse, when you lose your temper with your kids, the cheating on your homework, or the mindset that you don't need God and you're good on your own. All those things that you don't repent from on a constant basis. The gospel is that none of those sins are a death sentence. and see, Instead, Jesus got the death sentence on the cross so that we get another chance to repent and another chance and another chance. So receive this good word, the creative word that makes new reality in your life. Repent and believe the good news today. Change your mind by the power of the Holy Spirit and receive the good news that the glory and power has come the glory and power of God has come to sa and saved us, sinners, but saved by God's goodness. As a witness of God's work in our own lives, he has called us to be his witnesses in the world, to deliver his creative word, a word that creates new reality in people, to our neighbors, our friends, and our family. Now, I'm not saying that you should be walking up to strangers and saying, repent and believe the good news. But that is the underlying word, repent and believe the good news that changes lives. And it's a complete message. It is a testimony to the fullness of the message. See, that we are sinners who need to turn away. That's the repent part. And thanks to Jesus, who's done the work for us, we are not ultimately held accountable for the guilt of our sin. Instead, he has put that punishment onto Jesus on the cross. 
That's the message that saves. However you phrase it, however you approach the person, whatever your style or personality is, that's the message, the full message. One of the issues we sometimes run into is that we split the message. We only give half of it. If the message is only repent, then you're stuck trying to change yourself. It's behavioral modification. It quickly becomes problematic for you, and it leads to pride when we compare ourselves to other people, and despair when we realize who we are in front of a holy God. That's what happens when we only preach just to repent. It's behavioral modification. If the message is only believe the good news, then where's the room for forgiveness? If you don't have anything to turn from, what do I need Jesus for? What's the good news without the bad news? What's the need for good news if I don't have anything to turn away from? See, it's a complete message. I encourage you, be a witness to the full message of repentance and the gospel that God has called you to deliver, empowered by the Holy Spirit with a good word, a creative word that changes reality. Repent and believe the good news. However you say it, whatever words you use to craft that message, whatever timing you believe is right with the person or people in your life, share this good word. There's a whole world of people that need to hear the gospel and experience the kingdom. As one pastor put it, God's plan A for the world is the church, and he doesn't have a plan B. God's plan A for the world is the church, and he doesn't have a plan B. So that means it's up to us, up to us, me and you, to be his witnesses. Many years ago, Gaylord Kambarami was the general secretary of the Bible Society in Zimbabwe, he tried to give a New Testament to a belligerent man in Zimbabwe. And the man looked at him and insisted that he would roll the pages of the New Testament and make them into cigarettes. Now, Mr. Kambarami said, I understand that, but at least promise to read the page of the New Testament before you smoke it. And the man agreed and the two went their separate ways. Fifteen years later, the two met at a convention in Zimbabwe. The scripture smoking pagan had been saved and was now a full-time evangelist. While he had indeed used some of the pages of the New Testament as cigarettes, he went on to say, but when I got to John 3, 16, I couldn't smoke anymore. My life was changed from that moment. The power of God's creative word had changed his reality from that moment. From a New Testament smoking pagan to a witness of the power of God, the power of word to change reality. The word of God is living and active. As God's witnesses, we are charged to take that same word that changed the life of that man in Zimbabwe and changed our lives, repent and believe the good news, and take that message into the lives of others, trusting that God is working through his word to create new realities in people, saving lives, changing hearts. And in doing so, that is how we become and we actively are his witnesses. Amen. I pray that the message of, of God's ability to change our hearts, but then the, the call that he's put on our lives to be his witnesses in the world would take new hold of us this week. Amen.